Well, good morning and welcome uh, to the press conference for the launch of Strategic Survey 2013, the annual review of world affairs by the IISS. It's important at least once a year to examine global events with some perspective and to isolate those specific trends that will have an important impact. Strategic Survey performs that task. It provides, we believe, an ever-ready companion for those needing an authoritative assessment of strategic issues in any region of the world. Joining me today to answer your questions after this statement are Alex Nichol, Adam Ward, Nigel Ingster, Steve Simon, Emil Hokaya, Mark Fitzpatrick, Rahul Roy Chowdhury, Nick Redman, Ben Barry, and James Hackett. This year again, we publish essays that assess key developments in Europe, Russia and Eurasia, the Middle East and Gulf, Africa, South Asia and Afghanistan, the Asia Pacific and the Americas. An essay on the nuclear arms race in South Asia argues the need to develop dialogue to mitigate the risks. Our strategic geography section provides illustrated analysis on the shifting dynamics of world oil markets, Islamic extremism in West Africa, maritime disputes in Asia, the changing tactics of the FARC rebels in Colombia, the shape of the drawdown in Afghanistan, and many other topics. As in our general work, Strategic Survey 2013 looks to link geoeconomic and geostrategic trends, provide the context to understand recent events, and the analysis to interpret better those that are now unfolding. Assessing government policies is only an element of our analysis. Analyzing the impact of changing financial flows and social forces and the role of various private actors in shaping strategic action is central to IISS work. The diffusion of power and the privatization of so much activity of strategic importance have limited the ability of governments to shape agendas and to respond to challenges effectively. Indeed, the abiding impression of international affairs in 2013 was of a constant flow of events that political leaders, governments, international organizations, opinion formers, and people of all kinds were doing their best simply to manage. It was a year of living tactically. Frustration was regularly expressed about the insolubility of conflicts, the iterative management of international tensions, and the quick fixes that had best bought time for other unsatisfactory approaches. This amounted to a loud lament that strategy, let alone grand strategy, was now impossible. It was not only that the 24-hour news cycle and the dominance of social media commentary bled away the capacity for perspective and long-term planning. The lack of strategy derived also from a failure of leadership and a reluctance to pursue grander designs that might deliver longer term or more lasting dividends. The announced resumption in July 2013 of peace talks between Israel and the Palestinian Authority, brokered by U.S. Secretary of State John Kerry, was a reminder that political leadership still has a commanding place in human relations. And yet the doubt and skepticism that the announcement inspired was well justified because of the inability to pursue the peace talks with vigor. The largest challenge today for governments is the development of a sustainable foreign policy when the demands of crisis management seem so intense. It may be that if more leaders were certain of their domestic strength, then genuine strategic action could be a more regular feature of international affairs. Yet the modesty of strategic ambition has some benefits. Nothing is more dangerous than hubris in international affairs. Perhaps another year of living tactically will be better than a year of strategic conceit. But the very tactical approach to every crisis will reinforce a sense that we live in a state of sublimated strategic anarchy. As each problem receives a tactical answer, the difficulty of building and sustaining a strategic approach compounds, leaving few satisfied. The international approach to Syria has been perhaps necessarily the most tactical of all. With no UN diplomatic umbrella raised over the problem, regional and ad hoc initiatives competed for temporary effect. The humanitarian impulse fell into conflict with complex real polity considerations. The uniqueness of the geographical and political terrain appeared to constrain military and interventionist options. On the demand side, the proliferation of potential beneficiaries of support within the opposition, numbered at over a thousand groups, fragmented the chances of decisive shifts in the local balance. On the supply side, the diversity of political preferences for whom to support in the opposition had the same effect. Russian and Iranian tacit and direct support for the regime affected not just the chances of success, but the calculations by outside powers 
of risk and opportunity cost were they to take a more robust approach. Balancing these multiple global, regional, and local players defied a diplomatic solution all year. The use of chemical weapons on 21 August on a large scale has changed the Syria debate. It has not necessarily changed its tactical character, even if strategic language has been used to define the present choices confronting those rightly appalled by the use of chemicals against the Syrian people. The most important strategic case made for responding to the 21 August acts in Syria derives from the need to maintain the long-standing norm against use of chemical weapons. That norm exists in the most formal sense since the signature of the Chemical Weapons Convention in 1993, whose drafting had been inspired by the massive use of chemical weapons by Saddam Hussein in Halabja in March 1988. In the quarter century since Halabja, and since the CWC came into effect in 1997, there has been no material military use of chemical weapons. The argument became that a military strike was needed properly to defend the norm, preserve the integrity of the CWC, deter and prevent future use, and demonstrate that WMD use does not go unpunished. A proportionate, limited, and targeted strike would additionally demonstrate U.S. resolve to Iranian hardliners and Israeli unilateralists who might doubt it. These arms control, deterrence, and regional benefits of a strike are of potential strategic importance and might have been quickly acquired by a short and decisive action by a coalition of the willing soon after the 21 August attacks were confirmed. Military actions in defense of principles of deterrence are most effective if they follow, perhaps, the Macbeth principle. If it were done when it is done, then twib well, it were done quickly. It might be added that the exercise of deterrence is something that should, on the basis of well-established consensus, remain the preserve of the executive branch. But that consensus has to be well entrenched for the executive branch to act. The strategic view that only a military strike could maintain the norm against the use of chemical weapons and deter their future use is not one that commands the automatic majority assent of Western populations. Moreover, the exercise of a military option to serve a very precise arms control aim in the middle of a civil war raised concerns of an uncontrollable intervention. To use the language of strategists, escalation dominance could not be assured. A public that had been told for two years about the risks of intervention was not going to be easily turned in its favor in defense of an arms control principle. And so it has come to pass that given the lack of strategic preparation, there is now great difficulty in mustering support for military action. A challenge that was presented as an arms control problem is now possibly receiving an arms control response in the form of the Russian proposal being debated to put Syria's chemical weapons under international control and to have Syria sign and ratify the CWC. The fact that this is now being discussed has in effect preserved the norm of non-use of WMD and therefore for those who saw this as the main issue, their minimalist goal may be met. Whether this diplomacy of a chemical weapons use accelerates the diplomacy for a resolution of the Syrian civil war is quite another matter. It will be a lengthy and disputed process to put Syrian chemical weapons under international control. That effort should be used to encourage, not dissipate, efforts to solve the actual conflict. The difficulties seen in Syria in marrying principle to real politic were equally present in other parts of the Middle East during the year. Outsiders have had trouble defining strategic interest and balancing the advance of principle with a practical need for stability. The disappointments of the Arab Spring manifested in all countries where it initially took root became legion. The palette from which political outcomes have been painted has been at best varying shades of gray. New governments have not been as inclusive as promised. Many protests have not been peaceful or fueled uniquely by desires for democracy. The detritus of military intervention in Libya took the form of weapons proliferation and more violence in the Sahel and further risks of instability in West Africa. In Egypt in particular, democratic principle and democratic action stood in unhappy conjunction. Following the overthrow of Hosni Mubarak and the election of a Muslim Brotherhood government, some hoped that a pluralist and democratic transition would take hold. But violence continued to erupt in various places. President Mohamed Morsi attempted to put himself above a hastily drafted and unsatisfactory constitution. The fear spread, rightly or wrongly, 
that the Brotherhood was maneuvering to make itself the permanent party of government. With the economy failing and frustration mounting, the 30 June 2013 protests were by some measures the largest in history. The army removed Morsi and installed a technocratic administration and then began to pursue the Muslim Brotherhood in a way that appeared to eliminate the chances of inclusive government. Western governments initially wrestled with the vocabulary more than with the substance of events. Was it a coup or something else that could withstand legal examination? Some focused on the fact of democratic election, others on the experience of non-democratic rule. There were also those who chose to adopt a longer historical perspective, perceiving the event as a second stage in a multi-stage revolution. Still others viewed the events as the restoration of the so-called Egyptian deep state. The more enduring question for global powers will be how to support the slow development of inclusive politics in a wounded society now awakened to political action. For this, constructive engagement will be the only strategic approach. For the region, the central question will be how to deal with political Islam. Even among the members of the Gulf Cooperation Council, two opposite views had taken shape in the previous year. The UAE would not tolerate any Muslim Brotherhood sympathizers, while Qatar chose initially to bankroll what it saw as a prevailing trend. The future of political Islam in the Middle East will be the region's most important challenge. In Asia, the balance of tactics and strategy will perhaps be uncomfortably weighted in favor of the latter. Chinese leaders have been hotly debating how China's newfound soft and hard power can be harnessed during what they describe as an important period of strategic opportunity. Xi Jinping has taken very firm command of foreign policy, is resolute in defense of China's core interests, and wants China to be seen as a great power, indeed as an equal of the U.S. A bolder foreign policy approach that resonates with conservatives and the populist new left will find one of its greatest challenges in the attitude to Japan. China's stance towards territorial disputes is likely to harden, with every opportunity taken to interpret the historical record favorably and to assert claims unremittingly. In this effort, the new leadership will be mindful of Sun Tzu's dictum. Strategy without tactics is the slowest route to victory, Tactics without strategy is the noise before defeat. In the recent past, pursuit of tactical success has temporarily backfired. ASEAN members were appalled by Chinese pressure on Cambodia as the association's rotating chair to omit a reference to South China Sea disputes from a communique. To a degree, this stiffened their resolve to insist on a multilateral approach that China resists, but in general, a confident Chinese leadership will progressively seek to strengthen its position and consolidate its regional sway with determined strategic intent. This will take place as Japan bases its own policy on the emerging consensus within society at large that China, North Korea, and Russia are the primary threats to Japanese security. Both of East Asia's large powers are moving to develop external policies more in keeping with their economic weight and global political standing, and are also seeking to defend more plainly their national interests. This imposes on Washington, which has announced its rebalance to Asia, and implicitly its rebalance within Asia, diversifying and deepening its engagement, a requirement to act also with careful strategic purpose. The U.S. must reassure allies without emboldening them, and it must hedge against Chinese assertiveness while engaging with its resident peer. The Middle East and the Asia-Pacific garner huge strategic attention, but strategic survey devotes considerable space to the developments in other regions and to the connections between them. Western policies in the security domain continue to matter hugely, since there remain so few countries both able and willing to project military power. In strategic survey and in our general work, the IISS is intent on analyzing the issues that in the future will shape the strategic agenda, from the challenges of big data to the developing commercial and political links between the rising powers of the political south. The IISS remains devoted to distinguishing the trend from the merely trendy and to identifying the strategic questions that governments and the private sector need to answer. Our 10th Global Strategic Review in Stockholm from 20 to 22 September will cover all these issues, and we hope that Strategic Survey offers an excellent introduction to the themes that strategists will need to address. Thank you very much, and 
everyone here is very keen to hear your questions and even also to answer them. <coughs> Who would like to take the floor if you do, um, please raise your hand, we'll bring a microphone to you. So the gentleman uh, in the third row, just wait one second until we, yep. And then we'll move it across to you, yeah. Thank you, it's Alex Stevenson from politics.co.uk. I just wanted to follow up on the point you made about the executive um, in terms of deterrence and uh, clearly developments uh, in the last month or so, I suppose, both in Britain and we could have potentially seen in the United States, do seem to undermine further an already weak executive. So what implications does that have for deterrence in the future? Thank you. Well, I think I just want to make the cautionary note that um, traditionally the exercise of deterrence has been the prerogative of the executive branch. I mean, in the classic era of deterrence during the Cold War, deterrence only worked uh, because of the threat of an automatic response, and that response would not be able to be automatic if there was a need extensively to cons uh, consult legislative branches of government uh, before a reprisal to uh, a WMD attack uh, were considered. Uh, so in convention, acts of deterrence are ones that really are the preserve of the executive branch. Um, what I also said, though, uh, is that that was against the basis of a very strong public consensus uh, that had been strategically debated over decades uh, and on which the executive branch could easily rely in exercising its prerogative. And that simply is not this, uh, the case uh, with chemical weapons use. There had not been uh, the same public discussion and sense of comfort uh, with giving the executive branch uh, full freedom of the use of its prerogative in that way. And so insofar um, as uh, uh, we talk more about the risks of biological or chemical weapons use in the same way as we have in the past talked about nuclear weapons use, uh, that strategic debate will have to be engaged with publics in a more uh, deep and considered way. You, yes. If you just pass the microphone along. Yes, oh, you got it. Thank you. Uh, Alan Bad of uh, Itartas News Agency of Russia. My question is, um, uh, how do, do you assess the, uh, the chances, the, the prospects for success of the Russian initiatives to put the uh, Syrian chemical weapons under control? Uh, um, and um, d does this initia initiative, uh, implementation of, the, of this initiative uh, will require, uh, will require uh, significant deployment of ground troops? And which country may uh, provide th those troops? And uh, uh, and, and another question, uh, if this uh, initiative f fails, uh, will uh, the West be able to secure the, uh, uh, the Syrian uh, chemical weapons uh, from uh, falling into the arms of uh, Al-Qaeda in case that if uh, the, uh, uh, the, the Assad government uh, falls or disintegrates? Thank you. Mark Fitzpatrick on the practicalities of um, arms control in the middle of a civil war. There's never been a situation where the international community has attempted to secure, seize, and destroy uh, weapons of mass destruction during an ongoing conflict. Uh, the best case was in Iraq. It was after the conflict had ended. Even then, it, it took uh, uh, many months to assemble teams and uh, years to destroy the uh, assembled uh, arsenals. We saw in Libya, it's uh, many years uh, and still not all the mustard gas has been destroyed. So uh, obviously it's immensely difficult. The, the uh, US uh, Department of Defense had estimated that 75,000 troops would be required to secure the chemical weapons uh, sites. Your question uh, posed uh, uh, the uh, burden onto the West. Can the West assure that chemical weapons would not fall into the hands of, uh, of terrorist groups? I would imagine that uh, all states that have a stake in Syria might take responsibility, uh, including in particular those states that have a quasi-alliance relationship with Syria and might be in a better position to uh, uh, secure and uh, take care of the stocks. And I would, of course, uh, include Russia and Iran in that uh, situation. Yes, yes you said in the second to last row. Thank you. It's Steve Erlanger from the New York Times. Um, I'm curious, um, Dr. Chipman, whether you and the panel believe that President Obama is setting a precedent here and undermining uh, American authority with American allies, particularly 
in the, call it more dynastic Sunni world, um, and whether um, you think that weak leadership in the West creates the need to go to legislatures on key foreign policy issues, or whether this may simply be a one-off. Thank you. Uh, I'll invite uh, one or two others to come in on that. My first and immediate comment is that hard cases make bad law. And uh, in foreign policy terms, uh, the Syrian uh, case is a very hard case. And there's no question that there are a number of American allies in the Gulf and in the Asia Pacific that are, that are unnerved um, about the way in which uh, this issue has been handled, especially in the last two or three weeks. Uh, but I think the uh, types of concerns that each of those have in their particular regions is of such a different order of magnitude that you wouldn't necessarily see the way in which the Syrian crisis, especially in the last three weeks, has been handled uh, as ruling the way in which the Obama administration or any future U.S. administration would face different security crises in both the Middle East and the Asia Pacific, where concerns have in the last few weeks uh, been uh, raised. But maybe I'll invite... Uh, Steve Simon, if you'd like to say uh, a word on that, and perhaps Mark Fitzpatrick as well. I don't see this as setting uh, some kind of precedent, let alone a binding precedent for future presidents, in part because uh, every one of these con uh, contingencies is just a little bit different, just different enough to make uh, preceding experience not really terribly relevant. And I think if you compare the Balkan interventions to uh, current events, for example, uh, you have uh, a case of such a difference where the precedent set by the preceding democratic president just doesn't really uh, seem to apply. Uh, as far as the confidence that um, uh, U.S. allies have in its uh, reliability, um, uh, you know, that ebbs and flows, and it has actually for decades. Uh, and right now it's at ebb tide, uh, but um, you know, that will probably be reversed in some future contingency. And I would add that um, you know, perhaps what's most vexing uh, for these allies is that they have no alternative uh, uh, you know, for a security guarantor. Uh, and you know, that makes their, um, their angst uh, uh, you know, somewhat without practical effect, I would say. Mark Fitzpatrick? I, I would only add that um, though chemical weapons and nuclear weapons fall into the uh, so-called category of weapons of mass destruction, the, uh, the magnitude of destruction caused by them is of, of such a vast difference that I don't think that uh, parallels can necessarily be drawn. Um, and of course, uh, when commitments are made to states, uh, external uh, extended deterrence defending them uh, against attack uh, the Syrian situation isn't uh, actually in that uh, category right now. Richard Norton Taylor, The Guardian. From that, could I ask what your best assessment is of what will happen in Syria on the ground in the next few weeks and months? Yes, the best assessment would come from Emil Hokayam. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, I just best to spend a couple of, uh, couple of weeks talking to as many Syrians as I could. Um, and. Uh, and my discussions yesterday and this morning um, just you know, pointed to a sense of uh, dejection and abandonment, a sense that um, you know, no help was coming, uh, that all this was, was going to benefit the radicals, very cynical about the US-Russia deal on chemical weapons. Um, even those who were the most uh, interested in diplomacy are basically saying, why, why should we trust the West? I mean, you know, the, the chemical weapons deal was not about Syria. So it's pretty much about the proliferation norm that needed to be upheld. Um, I would assume that we're going to see um, intense fighting in coming weeks, actually, uh, with basically rebel factions, you know, lashing out where they can, the regime trying to capitalize on, you know, the, the psychological dejection or a uh, feeling of abandonment uh, of, of the rebels. Uh, actually, I s think that in coming months, in fact, uh, the fighting is going to increase massively. Uh, and uh, we will probably see even more massacres. It's, but, but just because, you know, there is a sense right now that there is no, th there's no outside help coming. So it's a free for all. The zero sum uh, nature of the conflict has been reaffirmed. Uh, so I had you first. Yeah, I'll come to you. Yes, from Japan. 
Uh, it's Masato Kimura, a Japanese journalist. Uh, so I don't think uh, Shia case is one off and special, and because uh, we saw that in the Pacific area, uh, Obama started with G2 idea, and suddenly he changed to uh, containment uh, on its uh, Asian people to policy, and now uh, he he would come back to uh, G2. And uh, in the case of North Korea, uh, he waited on the sea for the uh, last four years. And now he hand over uh, the decision to uh, President uh, Park Kune. And so I'm one. I wonder, so uh, the bad effect of Syria's uh, very weak position of Obama uh, do uh, a lot of affect to uh, China's uh, involvement uh, to uh, hand on the Senkaku. Uh, what do you think? Adam Ward, and uh, then Mark, if you want. Well, I think, um, I think the parallels between the two situations are, are, are fairly limited. Um, <clears throat> in respect of Asia, as you know, uh, the Americans have articulated a policy of deepening engagement, uh, symbolized in the in the pivot, and they've been clear to stress that this is something that has a military dimension, it also has a political and economic and a social dimension, and for all of those reasons is more um, sustainable. Um, clearly, uh, there are um, different impulses in the U.S.-China relationship. They're drawn together by economic interests, but they are repelled by uh, different strategic uh, uh, visions uh, and interests. The question is whether they can find enough scope within that complicated relationship to manage some of the uh, some of the key um, issues in that uh, part of the world. Um, we've done some studies, in particular, on the territorial disputes that China is party to. Uh, we're going to be studying the Japanese uh, Chinese relationship which is more closely in the coming year. And I think, in both instances, what we're drawing attention to here is that the weight of history. Uh, political incentives, nationalist impulses, the tendency for uh, diplomatic postures to be um, suppressed by uh, defense procurement and uh, defense uh, postures uh, rather than active engagement means that in, in the case of these disputes, including the Senkakus, uh, the option of a, of a sweeping transformation uh, or settlement is not available. Uh, but short of that, what are the pragmatic and practical steps that participants to the dispute and outside stakeholders like the Americans can uh, contribute. The front row here, and I've got you and you as well. Thank you. Now, if the United Nations Security Council adopts the resolution next week, uh, would that pave the way for a, a, for a Geneva II conference in Geneva? And the second question, if I may, after the election of a new president in Mali, can we expect a lull of the activities of Islamic terrorists in northern Mali and in the Sahel? Thank you. Uh, well, maybe James Hackett first on, on, on Mali, and then we'll come to the UN question. James? Thanks, John. Um, well, it may well make some difference, but I think the key challenge for um, you know, restricting the activities of insurgent groups in northern Mali is, of course, uh, the activity in the international community and how they are gripped with the situation and the support they give to the government. But it's also how the government develops the institutions of the state so that the writ of the state extends in the north and uh, security forces can extend their reach. So it's, it's a matter of building the state rather than just changing a presidency. Emil Hokayem on the prospect of Geneva II. Um, I'm, I'm doubtful that uh, the chemical weapons episode will actually facilitate diplomacy to the contrary. I think right now the conditions to rally the various opposition groups and the rebel groups behind a, a, uh, a political process uh, actually they've, they've shrunk uh, considerably. Um, just today actually a number of the top uh, commander, rebel commanders announced that they oppose the chemical weapons deal. Um, we have to understand that beyond the issue of proliferation, there are political dimension to that, to that question and practicality, other practicalities to, to address. Uh, someone mentioned uh, the possibility of deploying or the necessity of deploying ground troops on the ground, possibly Russians. Uh, if I'm a rebel commander after this episode, I'm like, send me Russians, more targets, you know, I mean, let me create an even bigger nightmare. These are the kind of uh, possibilities, contingencies that we have to keep in mind. There is no interest from what I hear and uh, from, from all my contacts in a diplomatic track right now to the country. I think it was set back by 
the management of the uh, chemical weapons attack uh, and this aftermath. You, yes, if you. Yeah, you Hi, Al Pesson from Voice of America. You've addressed part of what I wanted to ask about, which is the broader implications of the new uh, Russia, France, U.S. Uh, effort to solve the Syria chemical weapons issue diplomatically. You talked about uh, the battlefield and the prospects for Geneva, but uh, what about the impact of this process on the potential future use of chemical weapons by the regime on U.S.-Russia relations on the role of the Security Council? So if you could talk about those dimensions. And also, uh, although Mark talked about the impracticality of inspections during a civil war, I wanted to ask the broader question of whether any of you think there's a chance in the world that number one, there's going to be an agreement, number two, there's going to be any sort of resolution, and then number three, which has already partly been addressed, whether it could actually be done. Okay, well, a lot of questions there. Let me first um, uh, quickly answer the question about the UNSC. I think there were principally, though not only, two motivations uh, for Russia to intervene diplomatically uh, in uh, this issue. The first, uh, was to maintain what remained of the principle of non-intervention in the internal affairs of other states, and second, uh, to maintain what remains of the idea that the United Nations Security Council is the principal arbiter of the use of force. And those two aims were very substantial aims of the Russian authorities, and if it meant uh, engaging uh, with uh, the Syrian regime in order to attempt uh, a disarmament of, of chemical weapons uh, capacity, that was a price worth paying for those two aims. So certainly Russia is keen uh, to keep the UN Security Council relevant, and in fact this activity was probably designed in large measure uh, for that uh, purpose. Uh, Emil, on the prospective use of chemical weapons uh, after these uh, events, and perhaps Mark Fitzpatrick as well. Um, sure. Um, First on the, the issue of Russian influence, one of the reasons why we took Russia seriously, besides the fact that it sat on the Security Council and it's a global power, was the assumption that it had uh, uh, the kind of influence that restrained Assad's potentially most extreme types of behavior, including the use of chemical weapons. And I think so Russia suffered from a loss of face. I mean, according to British intelligence, Assad has used chemical weapons 14 times. So what does it tell us about Russian influence over Assad, his, A, his behavior, but also Russia's uh, uh, influence over uh, or ability to steer a transition process uh, if it couldn't con uh, restrain Assad on, on that partic particular issue? So Russia coming back in the game, I think, is also a way to recover some influence uh, to restore, uh, uh, you know, its, its, its own standing, saying it does have that, that, that influence. Uh, further use of, of chemical weapons. My sense is Assad will understand that in the short term um, he shouldn't resort to these, to these weapons. I mean, I, 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 I do believe that what happened on August 21st was a miscalculation in the sense that he didn't expect to kill as many people as, as he did. He didn't, uh, uh, previous uses were small scale, deniable, there was enough ambiguity that we all agonized over whether it was true or not. Uh, and he was very comfortable with that. I think taking it to the next level uh, was, uh, uh, came with, with a cost for Assad, including uh, A, the recognition that he had chemical weapons after you know, decades of denying it, and B, um, you know, offering to surrender them, which hasn't worked very well with much of the, the, his, his loyalists, who basically see him as having sur uh, surrendering a strategic capability, something that is very uh, uh, useful in the Syrian arsenal. So in the short to medium term, I do expect a, a, a stop in the use of chemical weapons unless this uh, uh, Russian uh, uh, deal, uh, chemical weapons deal, uh, uh, collapses and, um, and we're you know, back at, uh, at, uh, you know, at the very, where we were just a few weeks ago, then I think it's possible that Assad will use it. Mark Fitzpatrick? So let's give Russia credit for achieving two things. It got Syria to admit, to acknowledge that it has chemical weapons, and it got Syria to acknowledge the importance of the CWC and, in principle, a commitment to join it. So whatever happens with the Russian plan, if it all fails, Russia should continue to pursue that objective. And even if some of the sarin precursors can be secured and destroyed, that would be uh, an advancement over where we are today. And that's in Russia's power 
to, and I would say Iran's power to, uh, to succeed in whittling down the stockpiles. Ben Bowie, did you have something to add? Yes. It may be that that chemical weapon attack last month was to be one of a sequence of attacks. It certainly to fe seemed to fit into an operational scheme of maneuver to enable Assad's forces to re regain control of those parts of Greater Damascus that had fallen to the rebels. So there hasn't been number two, number three, number four. So it may be that the American declaration and, as, as Emil describes, ru Russian pressure has had a deterrent effect in preventing similar attacks subsequently. Um, yes, with you next, that's right. Uh, thank you, Nicholas Wade from the BBC. Um, there's been a lot of political rhetoric, maybe politicized rhetoric, about Islamic extremist groups seeking a chemical weapons capability. I wonder if you could tell me, do we have any hard evidence for that, or is it your assessment that chemical weapons wouldn't be a particularly practical asset for terrorist groups as opposed to conventional explosives or small arms? Uh, Mark Fitzpatrick on, on practicalities and Emil uh, Okayam on incentives. There have been reports that, uh, and I'm not, I don't think they're confirmed, that uh, opposition groups have uh, seized some uh, some chemical weapons. I, you know, the number of them that are available and the number of different places they're um, uh, stockpiled uh, does uh, mean that it wouldn't be that hard to get a few of them. But, you know, you need also a delivery uh, means. You need uh, rockets to fire them, artillery pieces, and so forth. And uh, the, the rebels haven't got that. Uh, that range of equipment and the numbers, uh, of course, that were used in, uh, on August 21st. So uh, onesies and twosies maybe, but uh, I don't think it's practical to, to think that the rebels would be attacking uh, in, the, in the huge uh, numbers that uh, Assad used. Emil? Um, yeah, the, the main report on rebel uh, having uh, acquired CW um, is actually Jabhat al-Nusra and I think they arrested 12 people and turned out to be anti-freeze, not sarin. Um, so I, I don't have any doubt that if some rebel faction could seize uh, those, uh, those weapons, they would actually you know, contemplate the use. It's not, it's not beyond their morality to, to do it. But we're not, we're not close to that, that line yet. I mean, for the moment, we focus a lot more, or in our discussion is a lot more about the prospect that these guys will use them than Assad having used them 14 times and you know with a strategy with doctrine with, with a clear uh, uh, objective uh, so, so I'm, I'm a bit worried about the uh, the imbalance in, in, in the debate about, about it. Um, yes the uh, Sunni radical groups are growing and some of them have said after the August 21st attack that now it's a free-for-all game that now they're no longer uh, going to restrain their use of violence against Alawites and others. That happened a couple of days after the, the attack. There was a statement by a number of senior rebel commanders uh, saying that if there is no response uh, against Assad's uh, use of chemical weapons, they will take the matter in their own hands. And I assume that they would be deploying anything they have, including chemical weapons, at a future stage if they ever get their hand on it. But they still don't have the capabilities to deploy those. Yes, you and then you. Hosni um, Imam, I just uh, wonder if you have any comment on the implications of the press reports today that uh, the United States uh, has started to uh, supply uh, the rebels with sophisticated weapons uh, on the balance of power in the uh, fighting there. And secondly, there is a, a sense uh, that uh, there is a, a news blackout in the West or uh, total ignorance about what's happening in Sinai. Um, I wonder if uh, uh, you could uh, comment on the implications of this on the stability of Egypt and uh, regionally vis-a-vis uh, -vis Israel and uh, the rest of the region. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, first, on uh, uh, U.S. assistance to the uh, rebels, a debate about upgrading uh, the rebels' capacity in the United States. Stephen Simon. Uh, I haven't actually seen this morning's reports, uh, but there have been you know, fairly persistent uh, and consistent reports coming out of Washington uh, for the f past couple of months since uh, the administration allegedly uh, notified to the Congress that it was going to begin to uh, supply weapons to the opposition. 
But at that time and since, uh, the word coming out of the administration through various channels uh, has been that the arms flow would be uh, limited and that its effect would not be felt uh, soon, um, uh, let alone for, say, another year or so. Uh, the administration seems to be looking to influence the balance on the ground um, you know, slowly ramping up over time uh, in, in a way that meshed the increase in the opposition's uh, capacity to use the weapons with the flow of the weapons themselves. Uh, on the sophistication of the weapons, um, I assume you don't mean they smoke cigarettes and, uh, you know, drink martinis or something. Um, uh, you know, how advanced they are is another story. Um, I doubt that uh, these, uh, uh, these weapons would go much beyond um, uh, conventional infantry weapons and the kinds of uh, uh, tactical uh, subsystems and components that are uh, required to make the use of those weapons effective in the field. Emil Hokaim on the Sinai. Um, sure. Um, you're right, it's not as uh, well covered as, as it should be, uh, partly because it's actually very difficult to get to the Sinai now. And, and you know, the, the Egyptian military has been arresting uh, uh, journalists recently. It's, um, the, the security in the Sinai has certainly deteriorated in the past two years, and uh, now that flows of, uh, uh, flow of weapons uh, uh, from Libya into the Sinai and possibly then into, uh, into the Gaza Strip. Uh, for the Egyptian military, this has become a, a key focus of their, um, their current work. Uh, it's a matter, of course, it has to do with, with the security of Israel, and uh, the Egyptian military is actually uh, happy that Israel, uh, you know, supported its, uh, its coup or, you know, did not uh, vocally oppose, certainly, uh, what, what happened on, uh, on July 3rd. Uh, but there's also a matter of prestige. I mean, right now, the, the military has blamed uh, Mohammed Morsi a number of times for blocking them f from uh, um, securing the Sinai. I mean, that was a very contentious pr uh, issue between Morsi and the military while Morsi was still president. Uh, so now the army, in its attempt to assert itself as the protector of the nation, as you know, uh, caring about you know, those, those core interests that Morsi had, had abandoned, uh, needs to do a better job in, in the Sinai, and there is actually c massive uh, military operation going on right now as, as we speak. And the third matter here is uh, the issue of Hamas. Uh, relations between the Egyptian military and Hamas have also very, uh, very much deteriorated, and the army is keen on blocking any, um, any supply of weaponry. And finally, uh, in, in, uh, you know, the Sinai is a, is a neglected area of, of, uh, of Egypt, and this explains the proliferation of, of crime gangs. Uh, you know, there's mass massive drug trafficking going on there that goes into Israel, uh, but also uh, uh, so criminal gangs, but also increasingly jihadi gangs. Uh, we're talking about, uh, you know, every couple of weeks, there's a dozen plus policemen or soldiers killed uh, at the hands of, uh, uh, you know, criminal uh, groups or jihadi groups. So I assume the military is going to make a big uh, show in the Sinai, uh, but as we've seen elsewhere in Egypt, um, you know, force alone is not going to solve that problem. You know, just like the repression against the Muslim Brotherhood is not going to help create a more inclusive, more stable Egypt. Uh, going hard into the Sinai uh, will may actually well <coughs> exacerbate problems in the medium term. And Nigel. I simply wanted to add that after uh, a certain amount of debate, we've decided to add uh, Sinai to our uh, armed conflict database uh, in terms of the levels of uh, armed activity that are going on, casualties, including civilian casualties. Um, you know, we, we think that it's now reached the level that merits inclusion. Yes. Um, William Ward of Il Folio and Panorama of Italy. Two closely related questions um, on the nature of um, well, new media and um, traditional electronic news media. Um, as uh, from your sort of elevated level of, of experts, academic and um, as strategic experts on world affairs, um, could you do a kind of rapid um, rev annual review of how good you think the world's media are actually covering or passing for the great public, uh, the greater public, um, the subjects that you 
um, deal with at a more expert level. And I'm thinking particularly of, say, the way um, the BBC, CNN, other international liberal-minded uh, electronic news media have tended to follow a narrative, and I'm thinking here of Arab Spring and particularly Cairo, when the only people you ever saw mm. being interviewed on television were very articulate, Western-educated, uh, very often female, young, uh, emancipated um, members of the um, uh, uh, of Tamarod movement, and one got no inkling two, two years ago that um, Morsi or the Muslim uh, Brotherhood were about to emerge. So, uh, and a few years pr prior to that, when there was the so-called Velvet Revolution in Georgia, mm -hmm. all you saw on the BBC was this narrative, feel-good narrative about Mikhail Saakashvili and what a wonderful guy he was, um, because most of the people around him spoke good English. Mm -hmm. This is obviously not a problem that affects you. Your affects uh, your research is done at a deeper level. Do you think that the Western media is improving or uh, or getting worse? at um, relaying the news, the, the facts as you see it, number one. And secondly, on the <laughs> subject of social media, yeah. is um, do you think that you as experts or the press are better at interpreting the social media flow that comes from the countries in the conflicts that we're mostly talking about? Well, the person leaning closer to the microphone now is Nigel Inkster, so go ahead. <laughs> no, right, okay, that was... Uh, right, well, I mean, I think, uh, you know, many years ago, um, a retired British journalist wrote a book with the title, Is There Anyone Here Who's Been Raped and Speaks English? Um, and uh, I think, you know, there, there is, you know, uh, some, some element of that. Um, and, yes, um, you know, we, 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 we do tend to, I, I think we do still tend to see um, stories uh, presented through, you know, through particular filters um, and, you know, communication, the ability to actually communicate uh, with you know, actors on the ground, uh, you know, is, is, is a problem. I would say that, uh, you know, the, the, um, you know, the handling of, you know, of uh, major stories by the international print media you know, varies very considerably. Um, one of the problems, I think, is that um, um, it's very difficult for uh, modern media to, to concentrate uh, on stories and, and follow them because you know, the, the, the big story of the day does tend to displace almost uh, everything else. I and mean, if you survey, for example, the British media over the last three or four weeks, there's virtually nothing on, let us say, Afghanistan. It's not as if Afghanistan is not a story. Um, on social media, I think we're uh, struggling, all of us are, are struggling to, to make sense of it. And some very large claims have been made um, about um, the way in which uh, social media can, can be used you know, to, to um, convey uh, stories, to convey news. And there's no doubt that uh, um, with modern social media, iPhones, etc., um, you do have a whole new cast of actors. Nick Gowing calls them information doers, the more conventional term citizen journalists, who are able to um, convey um, aspects of the story that uh, television crews um, simply can't cover. There's, there's more of it, there's wider scope. But of course, the problem then becomes, uh, do, you know, how do you make sense of it? You know, how do you triage all this you know, huge mass of material uh, how do you verify it, you know, um, and, and so on and so forth. If we look at Syria, there is, you know, electronic media uh, plays, you know, a very significant role. You know, the, the, you know, the, the, um, the, you know the, this is a domain within which this conflict is taking place, and rebels and uh, the Syrian government are both very active and innovative um, in their use of, of social media. But I think you know sometimes um, the claims made for social media can, can be overblown, and we tend to forget that, for example, you know the, the French revolutionaries in 1789 and the Russian revolutionaries in 1919 managed to have perfectly good revolutions without uh, um, Twitter or Facebook to you know to, 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 to assist them. Too soon to tell them. <laughs> Alex Nichol. <laughs> um, Thanks very much. And I think with the, you know, with the room full of the, uh, the world's media, we're certainly not going to say that everybody's doing a terrible job. Um, <laughs> and indeed, it's not, it's not true. I mean, I think two things. I mean, first of all, we're all aware that the whole business model for news organizations has changed massively and is still in the process of changing. 
because of the internet and, uh, and so forth, and that therefore resources uh, devoted to foreign bureaus have, have, have obviously fallen. And nevertheless, uh, because of the power of modern communication, we still can get from the media that we all use, uh, you know, a, a pretty good impression of what's going on, whether it's from correspondence or from directly from people on the ground, as, as Nigel uh, was referring to. I mean, I think, you know, we still all rely on, you, you know, highly respected um, in news organizations, newspapers, um, and television stations all represented here for absolutely accurate news. We without that, and we will continue to need that. Good, vote of confidence. So, um, uh, Kat Catherine Benhold from the New York Times, and then Richard Norton Taylor again, and then we'll go to you. Thank you. I'm curious how you think the situation in Syria is going to affect the power and the will of using that power of Iran in the region. Mark Fitzpatrick mentioned Iran twice, and I'm wondering whether the situation in Iran with a new president, clearly somewhat eager to thaw the relationship with the United States, is going to mean a significant change. Mark Fitzpatrick? As much as Syria is a complicated problem for Western nations. It's immensely more complicated for, for Iran. Uh, starting with who in Iran has responsibility for this problem. Uh, I don't think it's Rouhani. It's uh, the Iranian Revolutionary Guard, uh, the Quds Force, uh, in, and other military uh, security um, officials in Iran. Um, so even if Rouhani would like to use the Syrian uh, situation as a means of broadening engagement with the West, which I think he does. Uh, he, he doesn't have the levers uh, to do that. I, I think that in many ways, Syria is becoming uh, like Vietnam uh, for Iran, a, uh, a mess uh, that they're stuck in and they can't get out of. There's no good exit strategies. It's draining Iran of resources, of uh, economic resources that are increasingly tight because of the sanctions. It's draining them of of, of manpower and, uh, and the loss of, uh, of their soldiers who are fighting there, and it's creating divisions in the Iranian society. The best case for uh, Iran is probably if uh, Iran can be invited to uh, Geneva too, if that could get off the ground, and Iran uh, becomes a recognized uh, stakeholder, which is the reality, and that Rouhani's hand can be strengthened because he can talk to the United States about issues that matter to Iran, not just uh, the nuclear issue that matters uh, to the United States. Uh, yeah, you, sir, and then Richard Norton Taylor behind. But you, sir, first. Hello? Yeah. Um, thank you. Um, I'm Kazu Takaito from Asahi uh, Japanese Daily Newspaper. Um, I'd like to ask you about the uh, uh, ongoing coverage uh, about the NSA and GCHQ. Well, how has it affected the U.S. and U.K. Inter uh, intelligence community, and how will it affect? What kind of impact will it have? Um, not doing that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. We were kind of, uh, you know, we 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 had a small bet on uh, uh, whether and when this question would arise. Um, and I think you know, the, the, the short answer is it's, uh, it's still far too early to um, draw any firm conclusions about this. Um, but I think um, there, the, you know, the, you know, the, the, there are some uh, you know, broad judgments one, one, one you know, can offer um, at this stage. Obviously, it's, you know, it's very em em embarrassing and comfortable and unfortunate that so much uh, um, information has, has been made public. Uh, but in one sense, um, I think you know, those, those most you know, interested in the activities of entities like NSA and GCHQ have not really been told very much, if anything, that they didn't already know or could reasonably have inferred about uh, the capabilities of, of these organizations. And if one takes the example for, you know, of um, uh, Al-Qaeda leaders in the tribal areas of, of Pakistan, I mean, the, you know, they have been dark for some considerable time because they know perfectly well that if they use any form of electronic media, this will illuminate them and they know what, uh, um, what will happen next. Um, I think you know, and other you know, um, serious actors in this um, domain 
um, are equally, I think, aware in broad terms of the risks and threats to their own in information security, um, and you know, the, the, this you know, will, will perhaps not have uh, taken them uh, by surprise. Perhaps you know, such as, you know, the, the, the degree and scope of the activities undertaken might uh, be a little bit surprising. Um, and you know, it, I, I have to say, you know, purely from a technical perspective, what uh, NSA and GCHQ appear to have been able to do in, in just the last five or six years, because that is what we're really talking about here, is quite remarkable um, you know, in, in terms of, uh, shall we say, getting their arms around a massive surge in um, the development of um, information communications um, and big data and uh, learning how to deal with a problem that uh, probably not so long ago um, might have looked as if it was uh, potentially beyond them. Uh, so, so that is quite interesting. But I think in terms of um, you know, wider impact, uh, we have to look at this from different perspectives. In the United States, the main discourse has been about perceived NSA violations of the Fourth Amendment. I mean, if you actually look at the NSA documents that have been leaked by Edward Snowden and published um, in, in various British and uh, US newspapers, actually what you see is that this, this is clearly not the case, that uh, NSA have uh, put in place uh, quite um, explicit and uh, uh, complex um, systems and procedures to minimize the risk that um, um, the communications of uh, U.S. nationals, U.S. residents would, would be improperly read. Um, but, you know, of course, you know, that, that, that is not the story uh, that, that, that predominates in, in the uh, U.S. Uh, media. Um, overseas, of course, uh, various governments have uh, reacted with uh, varying degrees of uh, indignation when, when they have kind of been singled out. But the reality is that in today's world, Pretty much everybody, you know, has got um, you know, signals, intelligence capabilities. I mean, any any country that has a national communications telecommunications agency has, by default, a national signals intelligence agency with a reach, which gives them a reach uh, and scope that, that that only a few years ago would have been the preserve of a handful of uh, of intelligence powers. So, you know, the um, the, the the tears that have been shed. Um, you know, internationally about this have, have been to some degree of the crocodile variety, I would say. Q. <laughs> uh, Richard Norton Taylor. Could I ask um, if you think the UK has lost the will to mount any significant intervention or expeditionary force now? I think I think I will rely on the, on, the, on the previous short answer I gave, which is that hard cases make bad law. I think it's better to keep it crisp to that. You? Yes. Uh, Myra McDonald from Reuters. Uh, we saw some unconfirmed and intriguing reports about how the Saudis had promised the Russians that they would try and guarantee the security of Sochi, or at the very least try and keep the jihadis from going back to that part of the world. I'm just wondering if you've got any kind of ideas about that, and just even more generally the nature of Saudi Russian diplomacy and the kind of agreements they might be making between themselves, particularly on the jihadi issue. Emil? Um, it's certainly a complex relationship because, of course, Syria, for instance, is a source of tension between uh, Cairo and Moscow. At the same time, uh, Moscow and, and uh, Cairo uh, see eye to eye on the military coup in Egypt, where you actually had tensions between uh, Cairo and Washington over, over Egypt. So, you know, there is no, um, uh, I, I suspect the discussion about, uh, about the region is, uh, is, you know, covers all these issues and is, a, is more than just about, <coughs> about Syria. Now, there is a, you know, there is this notion that Saudi Arabia, because of its record and because of, uh, you know, its support of madrasas, etc., uh, has been a uh, key supporter of extremist factions in Saudi Arabia. I actually would uh, disagree with this. I think uh, Saudi Arabia, because of its history in the past 10 years, uh, you know, with the, the, the jihadi al-Qaeda challenge on its own territory, uh, has grown very uh, cautious about these groups, has really sought to, to restrain them. And, and I, I suspect that in Syria, if there's any Gulf funding going there, it's, it's uh, individual 
uh, funding rather than state funding. Um, you know, those there were leaks about you know the the, um, the meeting between uh, Vladimir Putin and uh, Bender uh, Ben Sultan, uh, the the head of Saudi intelligence thing. Uh, first, I'm doubtful that uh, the newspapers that got these leaks, you know, a uh, obscure Lebanese uh, newspaper and then translate it, that, you know, these are the real minutes, uh, to be honest. And second, I have a hard time believing that uh, Bandar would clearly, you know, tell Putin that unless you do this, uh, you know, we're not, we're, we're not going to restrain uh, jihadis before, uh, you know, uh, because of so Sochi. I mean, I'm not a... Russia specialist, and you know, I've never sat in any of those meetings. Uh, but I don't think if this, even if the Saudis were considering something, it would be the, as crude as what has been leaked. Um, and I don't think there is appetite in the Gulf at all to to start a new jihadi campaign to the country. They see with great dread, uh, uh, you know, the uh, what's happening in Syria and the possible consequences at home and, and regionally. Uh, Nick, do you have something to add? Yeah, I'm mean, just on that. I, I share Emil's sort of ba bafflement at some of those reports that came out of the of the, the Bandar uh, Putin meeting. Um, it's been a long-running concern for Russia that it's private Gulf money that's the principal external source of funding for for jihadis uh, mm -hmm. in the North Caucasus and, and actually now in some other parts of Russia as well. Um, the extent to which uh, the Saudi government could actually deliver on, on, on clamping down on that flow is. is one that the Russians are interested in exploring, but are probably skeptical on. And moreover, there was a very big Russian arms contract uh, with Saudi Arabia that was cancelled a few years back. And the Russians are still wondering why that was. They don't really understand the reasons behind the contract cancellation. And so, which was another part of that report, the prospect of, of a revival in that deal um, almost inevitably sparks um, uh, concern on the part of the Russians. The final thing to say about that relationship really is that for Russia, Iran is a much more important partner in the region, and to that extent, it really places limits on how far Russian Saudi cooperation can go. Yes, you, and then one more from uh, Ali Bahaju of North South Publications. Uh, why did the U.S. shift its uh, strategic interest from the Middle East to South Asia? Was it because the oil is no longer uh, a prime interest for? U.S. Uh, interest, and secondly, if I may, why has the the West, Western powers, been reluctant in calling the military coup in Egypt a military coup, because they have always portrayed the army as a protector of the people, when in actual fact it's protecting its own privileges, influence, and interest, uh, according to the World Bank. The uh, army in um, Egypt uh, owns more than a third of the economy. Thank you. Okay. <coughs> I'll ask uh, Steve Simon to um, uh, talk about coup language in a second. But first, on your on your first question, um, the United States announced a pivot to Asia. It then rebranded the, the the rebalance to Asia. As Adam Ward said, this is a rebalance that has uh, an intellectual, a military, a diplomatic, uh, an economic, and a social element to it. Uh, that rebalance to uh, Asia is an uh, important part of, of, of U.S. Uh, strategy. Uh, but it's been often remarked, and the events of the last several weeks, uh, I think, confirm this, that it does not um, deter the United States from looking uh, very importantly at the issues of the Middle, of, of the, of, of the Middle East. Uh, moreover, to the degree that the rebalance to Asia is there to reassure some of the traditional Asian allies of the United States, like Japan and Korea, a rebalance to Asia requires a persistent and important presence of the United States in the Middle East, insofar as those same Asian allies rely a great deal themselves on oil and energy imports from the Middle East. So stability to the Middle East is a core interest of the Asia-Pacific powers that the United States is seeking to reassure by its rebalance. So it's not just a rhetorical statement for the United States to argue that the rebalance to Asia does not diminish its interest in the Middle East. The two are connected. And um, uh, I, I think um, uh, that the United States, uh, um, uh, if you look at the, the way in which the, the, the Fifth Fleet operates uh, in, in, in the region, uh, re retains all of the interest that it had uh, 18 months before the rebalance was announced in the, in the Middle East. On coup language, Steve Simon. Uh, if the administration were to have branded uh, the ejection of Morsi as a coup, 
uh, it would have triggered certain legislative provisions that would have limited the administration's flexibility in dealing with the political crisis as it unfolded. So um, they therefore didn't use the word coup. Is there any, any yes, it was you. We'll take the last question from you and then we'll close. Go ahead. John Hua from CCTV. And just being reported that the uh, result of the report by UN inspectors will come out next Monday. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering whether it will be a very big change from the stance from U.S. and Russia after re after the result was released, or some kind of action from the UNSC. If it is some kind of uh, resolution presented to the UNSC, and whether there will be some kind of uh, obstacles to pass it. Thank Mark Fitzpatrick. I don't think the report from the. Uh, that the report will affect uh, attitudes in Moscow or Washington. It will only be able to uh, ascertain uh, that chemical weapons were used. It won't be able to say who used them. So Russia will continue to deny that it was the Syrian government and the United States and, uh, and Britain and France will continue to insist it was. And that division will um, continue to hamper a, uh, a clear uh, UN resolution uh, with enforcement power. But uh, some kind of UN resolution is still in play and possible. Uh, and maybe after the, uh, the report comes out, uh, nations will be more willing, uh, some of them, to sign up to it. But I don't think it'll affect basically the veto that both uh, Russia and China will wield over uh, a, re uh, a resolution that has enforcement power. Many thanks. Strategic survey is available outside for anyone who uh, wants it, and uh, my press statement is equally uh, available. We look forward to talking to you individually um, over the next days. Thank you very much.